Distinguished guests, ambassadors for peace, dear, dear participants, welcome to this session organized by the International Association of Arts and Culture for Peace. Before we begin this program, let me briefly explain about the interpretation. This webinar will be in English and translated into French and Russian. So if you need any interpretation, please click on the little globe at the bottom of your screen and choose your preferred channel. For any questions to the panelists, and especially to our keynote speaker, please use the Q&A icon also at the bottom of your screen. And as for biographies of the speakers, you will find them in the chat. My name is Melanie Kumagata of UPF Europe and the Middle East, and I will be the moderator of this session. The topic of this eighth and last webinar of the Think Tank 2022 Global Forums is Overcoming Division on the Korean Peninsula through cultural diplomacy and the arts. And it is organized, as I said earlier, by the International Association of Arts and Culture for Peace, IAACP. Our keynote speaker and panels will do their best to tackle the topic and answer the questions as to how art and culture can be means to bring a divided people together and have the power to heal and reconcile by letting us see beyond the barriers we have built as our deepest human emotions and hearts beat in unison. Korea has been divided for over 70 years, but North and South Korea both share a culture that goes be back to 4,000 years. Therefore, through today's webinar, we'll explore in words and through performances, paths to peace that are unique to culture and the arts. We will hear about cultural diplomacy from Dr. Mark Donfried, and we will also witness young artists expressing themselves in music, poetry, cooking, and through the visual arts. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mark Donfried, who is the Director General of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. Dr. Donfried obtained a bachelor's in modern European history and French, from Columbia University in 2000, and he also spent two semesters studying at l'Institut d'études politiques de Paris, where he wrote his thesis on diplomacy of jazz. In 1999, Dr. Donfried published Searching for a Cultural Diplomacy, exploring the significance of cultural diplomacy in regions that have been neglected by so scholars so far, such as uh, Eastern Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. And in 2001, he founded the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, which has grown since, since then to become one of Europe's largest independent cultural exchange organizations and continues to be committed to its goal to promote global peace and stability by strengthening and supporting intercultural relations at all levels. So Dr. Donfred, it's really an honor to have you with us today and to also introduce you. And um, I would like to give you the floor. Um, can I just ask you before if it's possible, if it's not, it's okay to just turn your camera horizontal. If that's possible, then we will see you better. Yes, that's perfect. Yes, Excellent. thank you very much. You have the I'm using the Apple. And, uh, is the sound okay or can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Yes, Excellent. it's very good. 
It's a great. So first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. It's an honor to be to be together with you today. I'm hoping I can uh, assist a little bit in the conference by sharing uh, some reflections on the use and actually the definition of cultural diplomacy itself. Uh, throughout the conference, as you see, we have some wonderful examples of really practitioners of cultural diplomacy. And so there, I think we can experience it firsthand uh, through food, through music, through the arts. So I thought it might be useful for me uh, kicking off the conference to share a few reflections. Uh, what is the need for cultural diplomacy? What is cultural diplomacy? And what forms might be helpful as we look at the peninsula itself in terms of building bridges uh, at the time when it actually building bridges tends to be more and more difficult, especially in the global situation we're currently in. So let's start, if, if I can, uh, with a few words of background regarding cultural diplomacy itself. Cultural diplomacy is a very misunderstood and very, you could say, misused term throughout the centuries. It's mean, meant different things in different places and in different times. So uh, first of all, I'll share with you sort of the official definition that we actually put on our web page, uh, which I actually wrote, uh, but it's based on actually uh, earlier forms of cultural diplomacy, and we tried to really expand the definition so it's more all-encompassing. Uh, so officially, and I'll just read for it, uh, read, read it for you, cultural diplomacy may best be described as a course of actions which are based on and utilize the exchange of ideas, values, traditions, and other aspects of culture or identity, whether to strengthen relationships, enhance socio-cultural cooperation, or promote national interests. Cultural diplomacy can be practiced by either the public sector, private sector, or civil society. So for me, what's important in the definition are, let's say, two things. First of all, uh, what is the goal of cultural diplomacy? This definition mentions a few. Uh, strengthening relationships, enhancing socio-cultural cooperation, promoting national interests. Across time and space, cultural diplomacy has, been, has done many things, uh, sometimes with good intentions, sometimes with bad intentions. I always tell our students, we have to ask ourselves, who is the agent doing the cultural diplomacy and what is their goal? You could have good cultural diplomacy, but being practiced by bad agents, so to speak, could be bad. For example, Hitler, uh, at the end of his time uh, when he was in power, uh, everyone knows Hitler hated jazz music, uh, but he realized the power of jazz as a vehicle. And uh, the later years of Hitler, in terms of his propaganda, he used jazz as part of his propaganda. One example where cultural diplomacy, you could say, was being used for very bad and very destructive purposes. So we have to be careful. Cultural diplomacy can be bad, it can be destructive. It really depends who's doing it, what are their intentions. And even with good agents and good intentions, you can also do harm. Uh, I'll give you some examples about that later as well. The second thing that's important with this definition is that it's clear cultural diplomacy can't exist uh, being alone in the dark in a room. You need to have some sort of interaction, uh, whether it's exchange, whether it's dialogue, there needs to be an interaction there. In the past, you could argue during the Cold War, cultural diplomacy was very often unilateral. Uh, I'm American, I want to tell you about American culture, Zoom, and I give you a unilateral message. Uh, I'm from the Soviet Union, I want to tell you about Soviet culture, Zoom. So a lot of the early forms of cultural diplomacy were in one direction. Of course, the better form of cultural diplomacy is bilateral cultural diplomacy. Here we could look at uh, academic exchange, where again, one student goes to one country and another student comes to the other country, going in both directions. Of course, better than unilateral. And with the birth of the European Union and many of the wonderful forms of cultural diplomacy coming from the EU, like Erasmus, Erasmus Mundus, etc., there we see multilateral cultural diplomacy, uh, which is, of course, for us the most interesting, where you have different countries moving uh, cultural diplomacies in different directions. So um, the other point I'll make uh, the definition is, as I shared with you, uh, it can be practiced by the public sector, private sector, and civil society. We'll come back to this today as well, because as we look at North and South Korea, I think really there is a job for each of those sectors. Uh, and really only if we can get all the sectors working together will we have a higher chance of reaching more individuals. Um, now, maybe to take a step back from the official definition, I'll give you two more unofficial definitions, what I refer to as classical culture diplomacy and modern culture diplomacy. Classical culture diplomacy would be examples like the British Council, the Alliance Francaise, or the Goethe Institute, where governments were trying to quote unquote, win the hearts and minds of foreign audiences. Joseph Nye at Harvard University would call this soft power as opposed to hard power, getting what you want by attraction as opposed to by coercion. And this is much of the cultural diplomacy that we saw in the 20th century and also in the Cold War period. That's really where things began. The more modern form of cultural diplomacy, and this I think is also very relevant for North and South Korea, I summarize in six words the definition. Cultural diplomacy today is how do we educate, enhance, and sustain relationships with the goal of building dialogue, understanding, and trust. 
And that's, I think, the main contribution cultural diplomacy can bring today to help establish trust between countries, between peoples, between religions, really any kinds of groups. We don't have to agree with each other. We don't even have to be friends, but we do have to trust each other. If we have trust, that's the basis really for any relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a business deal, whether it's a peace treaty, the trust has to be there. And it's on the one hand, so simple, you could say, on the other hand, so difficult. You know, try to find two countries in the world today where you have deep and sincere trust it's very difficult. In the European Union, we now have Brexit, and we're seeing more and more reminders of maybe a growing fragmentation. The USA as a country itself is so divided between Democrats and Republicans. They don't speak. They don't debate. They attack. Uh, I'm against you because you're this party. You're against me because I'm this party. Very, very unhealthy. And uh, there are many more examples as we look around the world. So therefore, even though it may sound simple, this idea of building dialogue, understanding, and trust really, really important. And in our studies, uh, we look at examples, as I said, from the public sector, private sector, and civil society, and then applications in three different kinds of relationships. First of all, where you have countries that want to work together at peace. Second of all, countries that don't want to work together, that are having some sort of a conflict, whether military or also colder forms of conflict. And the third category is post-conflict situations, let's say Rwanda or South Africa, where it's not only a matter of building trust, but also fostering reconciliation after the conflict has taken place. And we'll come back to this again when we talk specifically about North and South Korea, but, it, but it's very important that we realize what is the relationship we're going into, what tools would apply. And I'm seeing here my time is going quickly, so I'll just jump ahead to maybe uh, the four forms of cultural diplomacy and what I'd specifically recommend for North and South Korea. The classical form of cultural diplomacy we just discussed, winning the hearts and minds of foreign audience. I don't think that's so important in the case of North and South Korea. It's, you could say, you know, winning the hearts and minds, it's more propaganda. So I think in the end, that's not really going to help. For South Korea to say how great South Korea is, or North Korea to say how great North Korean culture is, isn't really going to help. It's not a problem if they want to have, you know, concerts or exchanges between the two, go ahead. Uh, but I think it's, for me, not such a big priority. What I would recommend is what I call the second form of cultural diplomacy, indirect cultural diplomacy, where you bring people together, not for the purpose of getting to know each other or building trust, but you bring them together for another purpose. For example, playing soccer. The goal is to play soccer. We're on the same team, we wanna want score. Uh, in the process, we may also get to know each other. We probably also will build trust if we have, let's say, North Koreans and South Koreans playing on the same soccer team. But the goal is something else. And this indirect form of cultural diplomacy is very useful when you have conflicts uh, or also post-conflict zones, uh, because you're taking the attention off of the differences and putting the attention somewhere else. The point of the priority today is soccer, uh, or the priority today is playing music together. If we look at Daniel Berenboim and the East-West Divan Orchestra, for example, bringing Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs, Jews together to play in the same orchestra, powerful example. Again, the goal is not politics. The goal is not religion. The goal is music. Let's come together and create beautiful music and perform beautiful music. And then indirectly, of course, we are building bridges, getting to know each other and building trust. So that's my specific recommendation for North and South Korea. Let's think of what forms of indirect cultural diplomacy we can do immediately now. The second recommendation that I have is what I call civil society cultural diplomacy. So really a, a, a cultural diplomacy not coming from the top down from the state, but citizens. And I think especially in a case where the political situation is complex, I would say let the citizens do the majority of the work. Let's have civil society groups moving back and forth. It's usually easier for them. They don't have to pay attention to governmental agendas, etc. And as a final comment, because I think the time is coming to an end, uh, I, what I say the newest form of cultural diplomacy, a cultural diplomacy focused on listening as opposed to speaking. In the past, it was always, I'm French, I want to tell you about French culture and French, French music. But what if we did the opposite? What if the South Koreans went to North Korea and listened to the North Korean culture and getting to know, and the North Koreans were to do the same thing? That's a more humble approach, and I think it'd be easier to build trust. So those are three specific things to think about. Indirect cultural diplomacy, civil society cultural diplomacy, and a cultural diplomacy based on listening as opposed to speaking. I have a lot more to offer you, but I will stop there and be happy to take questions now or later in the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, very insightful. I, it really makes me want to learn more about cultural diplomacy and hear more from you. But as we are short in time, I guess we will go on with the questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, our participants, you can send them in the Q &A, through the Q&A icon. Um, but if I may already ask a question myself, um, I thought it was very interesting uh, that you mentioned that during the Cold War, there was rather more of a uni unilateral exchange. And I feel like this somehow has persisted on the Korean Peninsula. It's not really possible to have any bilateral exchanges at the moment because 
North Korea is so isolated. And so I wonder how could that be overcome in the situation of North and South Korea? Of course, there has been some exchanges. We will see it later also through videos um, and testimonies. But still, how can this be applied? Um, perhaps, as you mentioned, if we have indirect cultural diplomacy, then maybe North Korea and South Korea will be opened to such an exchange because the goal, as you mentioned, it's not uh, politics itself, but it's really to play music together or play soccer together. So what would you have to say uh, about, about this point? So I think to do cultural diplomacy in difficult situations is not new. There are many examples around the world where essentially my recommendation is do the best you can. Uh, try to push as much as you can. Uh, there was a famous graffiti artist in Egypt who was very active doing graffiti, primarily political graffiti, uh, during the later years of the dictatorship. Uh, eventually it became so difficult with police and military control he couldn't anymore. So he didn't stop doing graffiti. He started to make t-shirts and he expressed his art on t-shirts. One example, don't stop, you know, get creative. Uh, another example, Israel-Palestine. We actually hosted the first peace conference in Berlin of a group called Yalla Young Leaders, uh, Y-A-L-A Young Leaders, initially started in Palestine by Palestinians, then later grew to have many Israelis, and actually all of the individuals who quote unquote weren't supposed to be working together were working together, and they did it primarily through Facebook. Uh, it was very difficult, of course, physically to bring people together, and sometimes it would be very, very risky that people could actually be killed. Uh, so everything was initially uh, Facebook, grew very, very fast, millions and millions of individuals. They got support from very high-level politicians all around the world. And then we hosted them in Berlin. We weren't allowed to do publicity before or after because they said also it's, they actually are at risk of their lives. If they were to go back in their communities and, and it was known that they were talking to the other, they could be killed. Uh, so you have to be very careful. So I'm just giving you an example again. Uh, we have to see what is possible, see what is also not going to put people at risk, etc., and try as much as we can. You know, if we can do it with a soccer game, let's start with soccer. If we can do it with music performances, the New York Philharmonic already has been on uh, both sides of the North and South Korea. Uh, let's start where we can uh, and then expand from there. Uh, and uh, sometimes Sometimes we do the same strategy at ICD. We initially asked ourselves, how can we get private sector and CEOs to come? They're probably not going to come to talk about art or jazz. So we said, all right, let's host the Berlin Economic Forum. So the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy was hosting an economic forum. And for that, we could attract them, that they did want to come. And of course, while they were there, we discussed cultural diplomacy and all kinds of other issues. So those would be some reflections. And again, you know better than I what is possible and what isn't possible there, but that would be how it begin. And also, of course, ask the question, what do people want? You know, is there interest among youth uh, to deal with hip hop or jazz or soccer? And you have to see what are the, the, the mediums that can work to, to work with the groups and the target audiences that we have. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. I think the, the good point, I, I would say, I would see it as a good point uh, between the two Koreas is that they have a common culture. So on that point, it's kind of easy to make it an exchange um, in culture, but something that they have also in common. Um, but I also see a question in the, uh, from the audience, and one a person, Benedict Suzuki, is suggesting about a cultural center in the DMZ. And I don't know if you've ever heard, I mean, working in this domain, has there been in any other regions of the world, um, two countries in such that have such tensions, but could still create a common cultural center that would be accessible by both people? Is that we have to see. I mean, there are many examples. I mean, one interesting example in Berlin is uh, most of the African embassies in Berlin don't have their own cultural centers. Uh, and they're actually, the South African embassy has offered to basically be host to many of the African countries. They have a big, beautiful embassy hosting others would be one example. Another example, not of conflict zones, but in Berlin, also all of the Scandinavian embassies share a building. So it's actually one building for the embassies and they have a common cultural center. Um, so off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of a conflict zone. I can't think of really a conflict zone in the strict sense of the word, the world where that's done. Uh, but again, I would try with an indirect way. So that instead of making a North and South Korea center, let's make a cultural diplomacy center, uh, or we can open up a chapter of the ICD, you know, uh, let's think of what would work, something non-governmental, something non-partisan, something, you know, non-for-profit, uh, and say, okay, the goal is education, etc. And it's doable. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but we actually created the ICD, the field of cultural diplomacy. Uh, before uh, the ICD, there were no accredited graduate programs. And of course, that wasn't easy. So the first accredited European Union ECTS graduate programs are ours and we're offering uh, every year. We have hundreds of students coming from around the world. Uh, that would be another approach to think of some sort of an academic center, uh, you know, in either North or South or both. So um, no, we would certainly be very interested if we can contribute. Uh, I was actually once in South Korea and so the foreign ministry invited me for a conference trying to also see what are the strategies South Korea can do uh, with the Korean wave and the, uh, the high success of Korean pop culture. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities and resources already there that I think we could work with.
Thank you very much. That would be very interesting to apply to this, this experience and knowledge also. And I don't know if the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy would be ready to support and cooperate with UPF. That could be an interesting outcome. Absolutely. Yes. Definitely. We'd be very open. Someone asked for contact details, by the way. Our website mm -hmm. is www.culturaldiplomacy.org. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure that the contact details, uh, or if you Google us, it's also very easy to find. And we'd look forward to any uh, any ideas for assistance or help or collaboration. Uh, the one rule I have, I'll never do something in a, another country unless I have a local partner. Uh, and there, I think you can help, of course. Uh, you're less likely to make mistakes, and you're more likely to do something that's really useful. Uh, so mm -hmm. that would be important to see who we can partner with in North Korea, who we can partner with in South Korea, and then and uh, really make the most of the local wisdom before we bring in ideas from the outside. It's noted. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much also for uh, your presentation. It was really insightful. So learning more about the power of cultural diplomacy being uh, also allowing dialogue and understanding and trust. Thank you very much. We'll have now a few performances, but if you can stay until the end, um, if you can comment also the few panels that will come after, that would be very great to hear more from you. So we will now go on with um, a musical performance, <laughs> and we will first have Mrs. Hyeryeon Jung. She is originally from South Korea, but currently located in Spain. And Mrs. Jung came uh, into contact with music very early, first with the guitar and later on with the piano, and she studied at the Superior, Superior Conservatory of Music in Madrid. And she has dedicated herself to teaching the piano, organizing concerts also with her students. And in April 2021, she released her first album, and Silencio Contigo, and is currently preparing Mi Historia, which will be her second album scheduled for April this year. And also her next performances will be uh, very soon uh, in the Manuel de Falla Auditorium in the Provincial Museum of Teruel, where you can also go <laughs> listen to her play live if you'd like to. And so Mrs. Jung has sent us a video of her playing two pieces on the piano. We will now hear first um, the one entitled Arirang. It's actually a Korean folk song, uh, which is famous both in the north and the south of the Korean peninsula, and is actually listed twice as the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage on the request of the two Koreas. So please enjoy. Hello, uh, my name is Heryeon Jung. I'm from Seoul. I'm going to play Arirang. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 정혜련입니다. 저는 서울에서 왔고요. 아리랑 연주하겠습니다.
That was marvelous. Thank you very much to Mrs. Zhang for allowing us to discover the melodies sung bo both in North and South Korea. And fortunately, we will be able to hear one more piece from Mrs. Zhang at the end of this program. So please make sure to stay on for that. I would now like to introduce our next panel, uh, which consists of Mr. Raymond Bateman and Mrs. Jian Pak. And they will be presenting the culture and art of Korean food. I am myself an admirer of Korean cuisine, and I've recently watched actually a documentary on Netflix, and I want to share just shortly about this regarding the famous dish of cold noodles. It's uh, better known in Korean as naengmyeon, and the reason why I men mentioned this dish in particular is because these cold noodles are actually enjoyed both in North and South Korea, and just like many other dish, but in particular this dish, naengmyeon, uh, is also really famous in Pyongyang and is truly appreciated in the South as well. Therefore, I believe that food is truly really something that can touch people's hearts as they are reminded of their mother or father's cooking or also their home country's cooking. And it's also a common ground in terms of cultural her heritage for the Korean people. Therefore, why not see food as a means for peace? But uh, <laughs> I would like to give directly the floor to Mr. Raymond Bateman. Raymond Bateman is from the UK and he lives there with his Argentinian wife. He is a musician and events technician. And through these roles, he has been involved in worship ministry work, as well as helping to produce several multicultural, multi-religious and peace building events. And he's also the coordinator of IAACP in the UK. Um, as he is the video producer and organizer of this panel project, I will give him the floor so he can explain in further details. Welcome, Raymond. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, greetings uh, to everyone joining us today. Um, it's, yeah, it's an honor to be able to present the following video to you featuring uh, my friend, uh, Jiyun Park. Uh, she is a Korean national who now lives in the UK with her Japanese husband and three children. She's uh, passionate about her Korean culture, especially its cuisine. Um, and she actually aspires to be able to help share and popularize it uh, more in, in the UK. Um, as uh, Melanie kind of mentioned, the food of your homeland is has a special warmth. Uh, it draws memories of childhood without cares or worries. Uh, the food that is common between Tehamin Kuk, the, the one great Korean people, can draw them closer beyond words and policies. It demonstrates one aspect of commonality that binds uh, before the dialogue begins. So today, uh, Jeon Jeon will share with us a very traditional Korean dish, uh, bibimbap. Uh, it's it's really easy for anyone to make and enjoy at home. And actually, after making the video. Um, already, I think uh, the other two nights ago, we made it at home here even. It's so easy and really quite tasty. Uh, but if you're not up, up for that now, you will also know uh, what to maybe order next time you visit a Korean restaurant. <laughs> so uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, please uh, enjoy the video. 안녕하세요. 저는 박지은입니다. 한국에서 창원에서 살다가 이제 일본 사람과 결혼하여 영국에 온 지는 12년 차를 맞이합니다. 오늘은 제가 만들 요리는 한국의 유명한 음식인 비빔밥입니다. 비빔밥은 여러 가지 채소들을 사용하고 고기도 사용하고 있습니다. 보기에는 아주 화려한 색상을 가지고 있고 그리고 베탈리안들과 비건 사람들이 함께 이 음식을 즐길 수 있는 요리로서 제가 오늘 만들게 되었습니다. 재료는 여기에서 쉽게 구할 수 있는 버섯, 무, 애호박, 당근, 숙주나물, 시금치, 간 소고기를 준비하였습니다. 마늘. 비빔밥 재료는 정해진 것이 없이 그냥 쉽게 구할 수 있는 재료로 준비해 주시면 됩니다. 
비빔밥은 한국 가정집에서도 식당에서도 인기 있는 메뉴입니다. 비빔밥은 초보자도 간단히 만들 수 있는 요리이며 각 야채들을 채를 썰고 기름에 볶으며 마늘과 소금 간으로 하여 준비를 합니다. 숙주나물과 시금치는 삶아서 물기를 빼고 참기름과 소금 간으로 맞추면 됩니다. 다 준비된 재료들을 밥 위에 하나씩 얹고 매운맛은 본인의 기호에 맞추어 고추장을 넣어주면 됩니다. 모두들 맛있게 드시고 건강한 2022년도가 되시길 바랍니다. <laughs> that was really beautiful. It really looked delicious. It makes me want to have a second lunch. It's somehow too bad we cannot try it, but I hope you all can try cooking it at home and enjoy this healthy dish. Thank you very much to Raymond and Mrs. Park for teaching us this art and culture of cooking food, uh, Korean food. And, and um, yes, <laughs> um, I also would like to just mention that perhaps um, thinking about Dr. Don Fried's uh, intervention earlier, perhaps we could even have a cultural food event between Koreans from the North and the South, and even from other countries, we could, maybe it would be a way to be reminded of the, of the common roots between the North and the South. So thank you very much for this panel. We will now uh, turn to dance and music with the Little Angels Children's Folk Ballet, which was founded in 1962 by Dr. Son Myung Moon to share the Korean culture with the world. 
And in 2010, to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, the dance troupe actually traveled to uh, 16 nations that had supported South Korea in the United Nations forces. And so you will see now excerpts of the encounter of their performance in North Korea in 1998, followed by the North Korean troop that went to visit South Korea. The children of the North and the South performed traditional dances and songs with excellence in front of an enthusiastic audience of the still enemy country. The video will be followed by a short testimony from uh, Mr. Jong Hun Kim, and he was part actually of this dance troupe's visit to North Korea in 1998. And years later, he became the stage manager of the Little Angels School in Seoul. So enjoy. <laughs> On their arrival at Pyongyang Airport in 1998, the Little Angels were welcomed by their North Korean counterparts. Sharing the same language and culture, they took each other's hands and embraced naturally. In 2000, the North Korean troupe visited Seoul and were welcomed by the South Korean folk ballet. Again, they quickly became close with one another.
investing themselves totally in their art, both troops were able to open the hearts of the enemy country's audience. Especially when they sang the song of unity, audience and performers became totally one. Parting was all the sadder as they had spent wonderful days together, and they knew they might not meet again for some time. For a few days they overcame through arts the division forced upon them seven decades ago. Just as all mankind is united through K-pop, even if we cannot feel each other's emotions directly, we can understand and empathise with each other through art, in particular through dance, and I believe that we can become one just by communicating. After the events, we couldn't meet or keep in touch. From our first meeting to the moment we parted, we didn't feel any prejudice against each other, whether on stage or at an event, we could feel that we were truly one Korean people when we sang the song, Our Wish is for Unity, together. Wow, that was really heartwarming to see these young children from the North and the South perform together, traditional Korean dances and sing together. Also, we could see how the audience was truly moved by their performance and also became one with them. Um, it really shows that art and music can really overcome barriers and also overcome prejudice. So thank you also very much to Mr. Jong Hoon Kim for the very deep testimony that shows the power of music and dance and which also allows mutual understanding and empathy for one another. Um, I guess Mr. Kim also showed the reality of the divided Korea, which prevents any meeting or even communication uh, between these young and North and uh, North South Koreans after uh, this exchange. Uh, but I hope truly that such events can take place again in the future. Now we will go on with music. And I would like to present to you my dear friend, Benjamin Laida, who will speak of music as a means to overcome division. Benjamin Laida is currently finishing his final year at the Conservatory of fine arts and music in Prague, and he's majoring in cello and minoring in piano. And he's actually taking part in different chamber and symphonic orchestras, as well as different choirs. And he has also close connections to Korea, actually, as he studied Korean language for two years in South Korea, and is also working on his bachelor degree in Korean studies, and uh, which he majors in Charles University in Prague. So Benjamin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Hello and greetings to everyone. Greetings from beautiful Prague. As you can see, there is a sunset right now. Uh, <laughs> so today I would like to talk about a music project that I co-organized in the summer 2017. It happened in Korea. It was a musical international project and uh, there were many people who joined from different countries. We had people from uh, Europe, like Great Britain, Italy, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Albania, Russia, but there were even people from, from Asia. So we had uh, uh, participants from Korea, Japan. You could really say that somehow the East and West was cooperating in this project. And uh, while we were mastering this musical performance together, uh, we could really understand that music um, doesn't know any boundaries, uh, that we, though we come from different environments and nations, it doesn't matter when um, we unite for this common goal and we share this passion. The piece itself was about harmony, about love, about gratitude, about um, virtues like that. Um, so we could really understand that. Uh, but I think that um, one picture can say more than 100 words. So I would like to uh, present you few pictures and, and, a, and a music video from that time.
must say that the project really brings many memories. And you can also see that though it happened many years ago, uh, we still keep the friendships alive. And so the second song uh, I performed with my dear friend Melanie here, uh, who comes from Japanese Swiss background and together with her husband, who comes from Korean Japanese background. And I, uh, I want to share a little secret with you. Um, the project that was the place where they actually met um, and <laughs> so you can really see uh, substantially that music can bring people together, literally. So anyway, I hope you could enjoy that and that's all for me. Thank you very much, Ben. That's very nice to see also the really amazing project we did together and I think it was very deep having people from all over the world playing together and also in Korea. That was very nice. So thank you very much for sharing with us your expertise and experience with the power of music. And it was also an honor pl to play again with, with you, although we were in, in person, but still, thank you. <laughs> so now we will turn to poetry. Mr. Carlos Badoza has prepared a creative visual production with the poems of Ko Un, a Korean Buddhist monk who was actually a supporter of the Korean unification. Indeed, in 2000, he shared his poetry at the Korean Unification Summit in Pyongyang in North Korea, and he also spoke at the United Nations Millennium Peace Summit. So I will give the floor to Carlos Badoza now, who will explain in a recorded video this visual production he has created. Carlos Badoza has a degree in philosophy from the Universidad Complutense in Madrid and a master's degree in philosophy. And since 2012, he has worked in the Espacio Ronda Cultural Center in Madrid, Spain, uh, as Armando Lozano's assistant and supporting also interfaith events through the production and of spirituality related media content. And he also has the experience in the organization of youth related activities. So I wish you a marvelous experience through the poetry of Kohun. And for those who do not understand English, there actually won't be any simultaneous interpretation for the poetry part. So please check the chat box where the translations will be sent in both Russian and in French. And um, also, if you'd like to go through the poems, once again, a YouTube link will be sent in the chat. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you for being there and for your invitation. Today we want to present you the reading of six poems by the South Korean poet Ko, perhaps the most internationally well-known contemporary Korean poet. Ko was born in 1933. He lived through the Korean War as a child, became a Buddhist monk, and he remained so for 20 years. Then he became a political activist in the 70s, and was sent to prison several times. But still, his Buddhist sensitivity remained all throughout his life and poetry. He lived a complex life, and as such, his poetry covers a wide array of themes, Buddhism, a deep contemplation of nature, and also a reflection on the scarred identity of Korea. The poems come from the compilation First Person Sorrowful, which have been translated by Brother Anthony of the well-known Christian community of Tese. I want to thank Armando for helping me choosing the poems and my friends Anthony Rosa and Veronica Polo for the wonderful reading. In the background, you will see images of Korean natural landscapes from the four seasons, which are so appreciated by the Korean sensitivity. Now I invite you to take a deep breath and listen for maybe reading poetry today and reading it in the context of this dialogue on the role of culture for Korean unification is about rendering the importance of words. Poetry requests an intensity of attention, but most of all, poetry shows how a lot of important things cannot be translated in the language of facts, numbers, political strategies or calculations. For in poetry, just as in life, we do not need to understand everything. We cannot. We just need to take what we need at that moment. But enough of talk. 
Let us let the poems speak by themselves. Behold, one white butterfly, ghost of wisdom, is flying over the foolish sea. All the books of this world are shut. From inside the house, a poodle's tail came out, welcoming. From inside the house, my heart came out, rejoicing and welcoming. I removed my helmet, laid down my gun, undid my bandolier. I took off my ox leather boots, removed my socks, left sock first. My bare feet emerged, pitiful, as fresh shoots beaten down. I looked at my wife's photo. I began to weep. The reason why that sea without ancestors breaks in waves like that, day after day, is because it longs to become the sky. It cannot be otherwise. The reason why that sky foolishly, day and night, produces clouds and then erases them is because it longs to come down to the sea. It cannot be otherwise. The reason why I cannot live on my own like an empty bottle, why I cannot live only with kith and kin, is because I long to become someone else, if just once. Otherwise, I have to live in ignorance of the countless others surrounding me in this world. You people marvel at the boy. Marvel at the boy's song. Autumn reveals my bones. My heart has been bruised to the core. It has become the blue sky. There is no broken knife lightning, no thunder. Yellow sea at sunset. No peacock's tail floats on the sea on the mountain slopes and inside their shadows the fallen leaves are blowing about the soul regrets at the seaside a few shells are playing now i want to learn nothing 
Oh, my ignorance in the autumn. I am most grateful to have grown up only in this little country, south of the Armistice Line. Look, now there is no soaring chimney smoke in the village at dusk. No sound of parents calling children. I would say that this is how we are today. A woman walking alone murmurs as though she has a companion. A woman reading a novel weeps with the weeping of a woman abandoned in the novel. Isn't such a woman at times also someone's mother? How can the Lady Maya of ancient India alone, or the Virgin Mary alone, be a mother? And a woman who has no child, yet can search through the darkness after sunset. Isn't she also a mother? A thousand years before, I was you. A thousand years after, you will be me. Together, we are listening. All ears. Late in the night, snow is falling. Soundlessly. Soundlessly. We are both listening. One life dreams of another life. Late spring white pear blossoms, their hearts throbbing, await the moon. One life resembles another life. In the summer night, the field of buckwheat flowers awaits the moon. One life inhumes another life. It's winter. The snow that fell heavily yesterday awaits the moon with all its heart. I throw a stone. Buried in the snow, it begins another life. Finally, the moon rises.
That was very deep. I can see also that the audience really appreciated this piece of art in the chat. People were mentioning how beautiful it is. And it's really beautiful. It was not only about poetry, but also music and visual art. So thank you very much to this panel and especially to Carlos Badoza and Armando Lozano for sharing, sharing with us the beauty of art, which truly transcends all barriers. So thank you very much. We don't have much time, so we will directly continue with our last panel with Mr. David Gonzalez Tejero, director of the Children's Choir, Nuestra Señora del Recuerdo. Oops, I see that I have an internet connection problem. I hope it's all okay. Please let me know if you cannot hear me. I guess it's okay. And it's a children, a hundred children choir who, ha, who has toured through many countries in Europe, Japan and Israel. And David graduated from uh, Sorbonne University on choir directing and he has studied Chinese music in Beijing and Yunnan universities and Korean music in Korea. He graduated from Oriental Arts in Madrid University and uh, he, with the choir, will perform Tongil in the auditorium of the Jesuit school, Nuestra Señora del Recuerdo. And he will share his experiences in Korea and Korean music. So once again, this will be a video, so please enjoy. Hello from Madrid. My name is David, and today I'm here with my students. I still remember my first trip to Korea 15 years ago. It was summertime. I remember getting off the plane at Incheon Airport in Seoul. Incheon Airport is considered the largest construction project ever in Korea history. It is the first impressions for foreigners who arrive to the country. I walk through the huge corridors of these impressive constructions to take my luggage. And before arriving to the baggage plane, I saw a huge mural on the wall of four Korean musicians dancing and playing their traditional musical instruments. The second impression of Korea was its music, its culture. It was not a coincidence. In Korea, music is considered a very powerful instrument to connect people. When we hear music, when we sing, when we dance, there is a part of us that connect with ourselves. And when we share it, we connect with other people's feelings. They know it very well in Korea. If you switch on the television in Korea, you will find a TV channel just with Korean music the whole day. We can see what happens today with Korean K-pop music in Korea and all around the world. When young people sing, dance the same choreographies and dress in a similar way than other people in the country, and in different countries are connecting with each other a feel part of the same ideas or spirit. Actually, K-pop is a modern and international projection of Korean unity. What is really incredible in Korea is the ability to give the same level of importance to traditional, Western and modern music. During many centuries, Korean people have created and preserved their idea of their country with dance and music. Farmers used to play percussion instruments like guns and drums to be here in the open countryside. They used to play and dance complex rhythms. This music is still taught in primary and high school in Korea. Here in Spain, students learn to play the recorded flute at school. In Korea, students learn to play the tansu, a kind of Korean recorded flute. They used to be made of bamboo. Nowadays, most of them are made of plastic. If you go to Seoul, I suggest you visit the Center of Arts, a huge area where you will find the Opera House, a huge auditorium where the National Orchestra plays, and also the National Gugat Center, an institution inspired on the spirit of Sila Kingdom that preserves and promotes Korean musical culture heritage. After many centuries, there are some songs in Korea history that express the spirit of their nation. Without doubt, the most famous song in Korea that expresses this idea is Arirang. 
There are many versions of these songs that dated from the last 600 years. When Korean people sing Ariran, they forget their political difference. Ariran is considered an unofficial Athen of Korea. What is more, it has been used in several Olympic Games in 2000 in Sydney, 2004 in Athens, and 2018 in Pyongyang. So, Ariran was used as the Athens of the unified team of North Korean and South Korean that got created for these games. Today, we will not sing Ariran. You can find many examples and versions on the internet about this famous song. Today, we will not even sing or dance to any K-pop music. Instead, we are going to sing another very famous song that the Korean community sing all around the world. The Korean community plays it here in Madrid, sing it, this song when they meet. There is a song called Uri Yesowo that talks about the desire of the Korean people of being one country and not a divided country. Now, here in Madrid, the children's choir of the school Nuestra Señora del Recuerdo will sing this song accompanied on the piano by Paul Garrido. First, they will sing a version in English and secondly, the original version in Korean language. really beautiful hearing Spanish children singing in both English and Korean and wishing for the unity of the two Koreas. So thank you very much to Mr. Gonzalez Tejero and your choir. Thank you very much. And now we can we before we come to an end, before we close this session, I would like to ask Dr. Donfried uh, to come again and to give a comment on all these artistic performances and projects we have just seen, and perhaps also add a word regarding uh, cultural diplomacy after seeing all this. You have the floor. Uh, please unmute your mic, please. All right. 
There we go. Okay. So now I'd be happy to add a few reflections and also to take any questions. They may have emerged by anyone throughout the course of the conference. But uh, no, I think we were all inspired. What we see here at today's conference is a lot of incredible uh, energy and potential. And it's really just a matter of, I think, moving things forward. So I think for me, the next step uh, is ideally one of the participants or one of the uh, those in the audience uh, takes some of these ideas, hopefully as inspiration, and actually implements them. And it's really just as simple as sending the first email, you know, contacting the first NGO or your own NGO itself and organizing the first concert or organizing the first soccer game. Uh, and I think that's what I hope may come as also some of the uh, outcomes from the conference. Uh, as I said, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy stands ready and also is interested to the best of our ability uh, if we can support initiatives as well. Also just to make people aware of the initiatives to send to our database or through the website, etc. cetera, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, we're also very happy to receive uh, students uh, from North Korea and South Korea. As I said, we have our academic programs and a MBA PhD. Now, the entire time of Corona, we've actually grown. Uh, when necessary, we do things online. As soon as we could last year, we also had the students in the classroom together. Uh, so that's a perfect opportunity as well through the studies, uh, as well as through the events of the ICD. Again, maybe outside of the peninsula to bring people together. Uh, ideally, we should be doing both. Uh, so hopefully, we can get some initiatives taking place on the peninsula. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing any outcomes that may emerge. Uh, hopefully, is is inspiration or encouragement uh, from today's events. And uh, yeah, but I, I very much enjoyed, uh, as I think we all did, uh, the presentations and the videos. Uh, and you see here really, you know, concrete examples uh, of cultural diplomacy being implemented already. Uh, and let's see how we can expand on that. Uh, can we change the world through cultural diplomacy? Probably not. Uh, but I think definitely cultural diplomacy can make contributions together with the political and the economic uh, wings, so to speak, uh, coming together. Uh, so I would say let's do everything we can, probably initially through the civil society, uh, to, to create a bridge. And one uh, thing not to forget, uh, as you see in the world, governments come and go, politics comes and goes and change, although actually civil society remains. So the potential really is there for the civil society on both sides, in North Korea and in South Korea, to build bridges that ideally can remain, uh, no matter what happens on the official uh, uh, radar. So maybe that gives us a little bit more encouragement to us as private citizens, as artists, as musicians, as athletes, uh, to, to engage ourselves. And I think we have much more power than we actually think. So I'll stop there. And please, if there are any other questions or comments, be happy to respond. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I would like to combine a few questions that came in. It's related a little bit to what you've mentioned as cultural diplomacy also having a negative outcome. So for example, for propaganda and which can also create barriers, but also to the fact that sometimes countries are not open to other countries' cultures. So for example, modern South Korean culture would be Korean dramas and K-pop, for example, and North Korea isn't quite open to that. So how can we overcome these barriers somehow? And also, and also, if I can add just a second question, um, how can we make sure that propaganda doesn't endanger the relationships even more? Mm -hmm. All right, so regarding propaganda, I actually have a lecture I usually do with our students asking the question, what is the difference between cultural diplomacy, propaganda, and advertising? Uh, and in many cases, there isn't a difference. During the Cold War period, really, cultural diplomacy was propaganda, it was advertising. Uh, so it's not necessarily bad. However, I always encourage the cultural dipl diplomats of today to try to distance themselves as much as they can from propaganda. Uh, can we have neutrality? No. I don't think anyone's neutral. I have an agenda, you have an agenda. It's the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy. So you could say there's an agenda there as well. We're promoting cultural diplomacy. So there's nothing wrong with agendas, but I think we have to really be open and transparent about it. Uh, the fact that the Mercedes car company is trying to make money, okay, they're a for-profit company, let them do it. It's better for their employees and those are there. There's nothing bad about that. Uh, that a country wants to, you know, uh, promote its interests abroad is also okay. It's normal. Uh, so I think that you have to see how can we navigate through different agendas. Sometimes there's propaganda, sometimes not, and get what we want. Uh, so as I said before, there was this graffiti artist in Egypt. He wasn't able to do graffiti eating more in the buildings, he made t-shirts. So we have to see what are the t-shirts for us or what are the opportunities that we can do. Uh, if we can't organize a big art exhibition in North Korea, okay, let's do a smaller one. Uh, if we can't do a smaller one, let's do a conference. If we can't do a cultural diplomacy conference, let's do an economics conference. You know, somehow see, you know, what are the, the possibilities there? Uh, and the key thing is trying to, again, bring those people together. Uh, indirectly usually is easier than directly. 
So that would be you know, a few thoughts. And again, I leave this really to you and the experts from North and South Korea. Uh, but in general, we deal with these challenges every day. We don't have a budget or we don't have a visa to go to the country or we don't have the permission of the government or we don't have a venue. There's always a lot of stones in the past, so to speak. So every day you have to take the stones away from the past or put them in your backpack and take them with you. And then the backpack's going to get heavier, but then you get stronger the more rocks you carry every day. And then there's always going to be obstacles. So therefore, that, that would be my advice. And if you can't do it in North Korea, okay, have the first event in South Korea where you bring North Koreans there or you know, try to see as, as far as you can go. And I think culture diplomacy, it's always a matter of pushing the limits as much as you can. Realize that you may fail and realize that it could backfire and realize that you could also cause more problems than good. You know, maybe if you are able to do that first event in North Korea, you could also, it could backfire. Uh, so really anything is possible. You're never dealing with a perfect situation. Now, the best way to try to avoid making a mistake is again, getting partners from both sides uh, and getting also ideally each of the, the sectors. So if you have the public sector, private sector and civil society together, you're more likely to serve the interests of more citizens. If it's only the government or if it's only a private sector company or only civil society, you're less likely to fulfill the needs of, of more uh, citizens. So th those are a few reflections. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. And thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us and for staying up until the end. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. And thank you to all of the participants. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot and I have new energy and hopefully to, to see and maybe participate in new initiatives on the peninsula. Thank you very much. I hope we can stay in contact and do many great programs in the future. Thank you very much. I look forward as well. Thank you. We will now um, end this last, I mean, this eighth session, but uh, it's not the end yet. Don't leave us yet because we will have the closing session for the this Think Tank 2022 Global Forums. And so I first of all want to thank all the speakers of this panels and also the participants online. Um, and as a transition to the closing session, we will hear once again the pianist, Mrs. Hye Yeon Jung in a personal composition entitled Forgiveness. Many terrible acts were committed during the fratricidal war between North and South Korea until the truce finally ended it and the DMZ was established be between the two Koreas. And in order to overcome the resentments and the hurts on both sides and to put an end to division, forgiveness is a must. Let us therefore hear this composition, praying that forgiveness can melt all the pain away and a new history of a reunified Korean Peninsula can begin. I going to play my composition, Perdón.
Thank you very much, Mrs. Chung, for this beautiful song of forgiveness. We will now directly continue with the closing session of the Think Tank 2022 for Global Forums, which were on the theme of, of toward peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I would like to directly invite Dr. Michael Balcom for his closing remarks. Dr. Michael Balcom currently serves as the regional president of the Family Federation for World Peace for the combined 72 nations of Europe and the Middle East and Eurasia. And I'm very sorry, <laughs> I just lost. Very good. I will continue. He was born in Nigeria, educated in England and the US, and he also joined the unification movement in California in 1976. And he and his wife, Fumiko, have five children aged from 30 to 20, all still living in the US. Dr. Balcom, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Melanie. And uh, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, what a great session this has been. Not just talk, but uh, a feast for the senses, for the ears, uh, for the heart. And uh, the only bit I struggled with really was the cooking part. Not because I don't like cold noodles. I do like cold noodles. Uh, but I'm here in a lockdown quarantine hotel in Seoul, and my last 15 meals have been cold, many of them cold noodles. So I really need something hot to eat. Uh, but apart from that, uh, it was really great. And thank you, uh, Mark, for your uh, illustration of the difficulties of cultural diplomacy. I love that image of finding the stones and putting them in your backpack as you move along, because indeed there are many obstacles. We are uh, about to host a world summit here in Korea. Two years ago, uh, before COVID, we had 7,000 people in, att in attendance. This time with COVID and with the South Korean extreme response to it, uh, we're struggling to even have 70. But I know that it's going to have a great impact as indeed have these uh, think tanks from the last three days. Actually, over the last three days, we've heard so many different perspectives. I would almost call them opinions, but I'll be more polite. Um, we've even realized that basic facts are not agreed on. For example, how did the Korean division start? We've heard that it was North Korea's fault. We heard that it was America's fault, that it was Russia's fault. Even such basic facts couldn't be agreed on. Some optimistic speakers said they felt that South Korean, North Korean unification was closer than ever before. But others, I could call them pessimists, but maybe we could call them realists, said, look what's going on this week alone. There have been three missiles fired from North Korea out across the Sea of Japan. And meanwhile, here in South Korea, there's a really brutal Korean presidential election going on with the candidates uh, taking no, missing no opportunity to attack each other, just like, of course, in England and the United States. Some people have said that actually this isn't a problem that Koreans can solve by themselves, pointing out that the division of Korea wasn't a, a Korean idea. Of course it was not, it was at the end of World War II. So some say actually the surrounding powers have to be more involved. And we heard a little bit about that, about the desires or wishes of Japan, China, Russia, the United States. But others said, well, wait a minute, are you sure that these surrounding powers can tolerate a unified Korea? After all, there would be almost 90 million people and if you combine South Korea's financial muscle with North Korea's weaponry and nuclear weapons, is that perhaps too formidable a force? And perhaps people are more happy to leave things the way they are. One panelist who really resonated with me was William McComish, the Dean of the uh, Cathedral in Geneva. Uh, and he said that when we look at things from a human perspective, it really looks as if peace could be decades away or even impossible. But he said, quoting scripture, with God, all things are possible. And this is indeed the fundamental philosophy of the Universal Peace Federation, something that perhaps is not so politically correct to say that many of us believe strongly is that there has to be intervention from God, that human efforts alone is just not enough. And certainly, uh, this would be agreed to by our co-founders, the late Reverend Dr. Sun Young Moon and Mother Hak Jahan Moon, who uh, they both celebrate their birthday on the same day. 
uh, in three days' time. Would have been Reverend Moon's 102nd birthday. He passed in 2012. And it is uh, Mother Moon's 79th birthday. I hope she doesn't mind me uh, spilling the beans on that. But I think they would also say that we shouldn't be sitting around waiting for divine intervention. We have to take action and responsibility. And in that, I'm reminded of the words of Benjamin Franklin, the founding father of my United States. Benjamin Franklin said there are two principal ways to serve God. The first way, the easy way, is to pray. And that's why most people choose to pray and nothing else. But he went on to say that the most acceptable way to serve God is to serve our fellow man. And today we would add our, our fellow woman. That's easily said, of course, but, but how do you actually do it? Speaking here in Seoul the year before his death, uh, Reverend Dr. Moon said the only way for peaceful reunification is if North Koreans make a resolution to love South Korea more than they love their own nation and for South Koreans to love North Korea more than they love their own country. And as that was th sinking into the audience, he said, but how is that possible? How can anyone love another country more than their own? He had an answer for that as well. He said, well, actually, there have to be families that combine the North and South husbands from the north, wives from the south, and vice versa. And then in the next generation, the grandchildren of those families will be living all over the peninsula. And if your own grandchildren live in the north or the south, that country can never be your enemy anymore. Actually, he said the same for Russia and America, Russia and Ukraine, wherever there's conflict in the world today, in the end, families of peace will make a peaceful world. So on that note, I want to thank everybody who's been participating in these think tanks. Uh, let us have faith in God, but also faith in each other's goodness and desire to see peace, not just in Korea, but wherever we are. In fact, uh, why I, my personal determination is I want to be a peacemaker. I want to take what I've learned in these last three days and apply it where I am with the people I meet because surely peace starts with me. Thank you very much, and back to you, Melanie. Thank you very much, Dr. Balcom, for sharing also the vision of the UPF founders on truly loving others, and also for their overview of the past three days webinars. Thank you very much. And um, I would also say that um, just to end, <laughs> that the, these Think Tank 2022 Global Forums were also um, really put forward to create a foundation for the World Summit 2022, which will take place next week from February 11th to 13th. And you're also welcome to join online to hear insightful speeches and uh, share your ideas on the topic. Uh, before we end with a video uh, on the World Summit 2022 and that we take a group picture, I would like to share three announcements. First of all, if you'd like to stay tuned with UPS, UPF's activities and events, please also follow us on our social medias on Facebook, Instagram, Vimeo and YouTube. And you can also check our website under ume.upf.org. And also if you'd like an attendance certificate, you can apply for it on the Think Tank 2022 UME website. Lastly, um, today, there will be at 3 p.m. CET, so very soon, another webinar organized by UPF North America. And uh, if you'd like to join, you can. It's also um, a joint session with UPF Europe and the Middle East, and it will be on the topic of the role of academicians in bringing peace to the Korean Peninsula, and it's organized by the International Association of Academicians for Peace. So thank you very much once again to all our speakers and also to our great and enthusiastic audience who has joined us from all over the world uh, for the past three days and also today, and also our staff who has been working wholeheartedly for the past month to make this Think Tank 2022 Global Forums possible. So thank you very much. I would like to invite all of you to turn on your cameras so we can take a group picture all together, the speakers and staff, if you can. I'll come on if the technicians can make sure.
And I'll count down to three, three, two, one, smile. Good, and maybe we can all wave as well. <laughs> very good, thank you very much. So yes, thank you. And um, we will now end this Think Tank 2022 Global Forums with a video introducing the World Summit 2022 taking place next week. You're welcome to join as well. Uh, next week. So enjoy and have a nice rest of the day. Goodbye. Only when we take action can we make our world a brighter place. Let our good deeds bring the light of hope and peace around the world. Let's stand arm in arm as we are one human family. Summit for Peace on the Korean Peninsula.